All right, let's, we've got everybody. Um, yeah, so the Beacon Food Forest, there's a photo of it right there. Um, you already went through a land acknowledgement, but I'll, I'll do a quick one as well, just for our organization. Um, I don't think it's something you can overemphasize. Um, so we acknowledge that we are occupying the stolen ancestral lands of the Coast Salish, Duwamish, Suquamish, and Muckleshoot people. They have stewarded this land since time immemorial and continue to today. Just checking everybody can see everything. Okay, awesome. So just a little history. Um, I'm relatively new to the organization. I started in April of last year, um, but it's been around for almost 10 years. So um, in 2009, um, there were four people that studied permaculture design and they basically sketched out this like blueprint and presented it to the city of Seattle. Um, and of course this was a very new thing at the time. And so um, it was a brave thing to do for them. And there was a lot of pushback um, is from, from what I've heard. Um, however, um, you know, they made the case that this was going to impact the community in a positive way. And they really did have to go out in the community and get community support for that. And so um, my work is kind of continuing that as well. Um, and so in September, 2012, uh, the first trees, fruit trees were planted and the work began to transform the one point, roughly 1.75 acres of grass into a food forest and a giving garden and a, and a couple of pea patch plots as well. Um, so, th so this made us the first and largest food forest um, on public lands in the United States. Um, pretty big deal. Um, and then in 2018, uh, a group of volunteers incorporated uh, the Food Forest Collective as a 501c3 nonprofit. And in 2019, um, a year later, uh, phase two began. And the reason for that word phase is um, essentially as um, the blueprints were drafted by um, the designers um, of the food forest, they had to present them in phases to the city. So it wasn't like, oh, you can you know, go have at it seven acres all at once. It's like you have to prove it to us. And so there was, there was definitely a process of doing that. Um, and so we're in phase two still, um, takes a lot of time to develop land um, into a food forest. So in 2020, um, as the pandemic kind of um, began in the United States, we, we intensified vegetable production uh, through our food bank plot because of the economic fallout due to COVID-19. There was a very um, specific group of volunteers that's very dedicated to that. And I can talk more about that in a minute. So here are some photos of the food forest. Um, on the top left, there's some, uh, this was actually me and a couple of the interns this past summer. We, um, it was kind of just like a, a fun idea, but um, also very uh, relevant to the community. Uh, we just gathered up a bunch of berries like salmon berry, um, raspberry, mulberry, blueberries, um, actually not salmon berry, sorry, that's golden raspberry. But we sampled them in little Dixie cups like on 15th Avenue South because that's a, that's the main street that like Beacon Food Forest is on. So um, I just kind of decided, oh, that would be great to like, see what people, people's knowledge of the food forest is. And, and if they know that they can come get all these good foods from us, um, because that is one of our policies is open harvest. We want to make sure, um, you know, people know about this place that, you know, is so abundant with food. Um, and so there's just some different pictures, some uh, pictures of the fruit trees and um, different ones. We planted a bunch of chestnut trees. So that's the one on the right side. We planted those in the big tree guild this past or in 2021. Um, there's some edible flowers in the, on the bottom left, some calendula, borage, fun stuff. And then, um, yeah, just a couple of pictures that were taken recently. Uh, Alice, you're, I know you're monitoring the chat, but just let me know if anyone has questions as we move along. 
So some other important facts, um, most of the food forest, like I said, is open harvest, except for the pea patch. So, so I guess kind of the, the way we started was that, um, so the city of Seattle has a pea patch community garden program. So it's not like, you know, just us, but there's many different pea patches throughout Seattle. And we used that program kind of as a partnership. And we still have that partnership in a way with, um, to, to the city of Seattle through that program. And so we have what are called family plots, which are kind of like your standard, um, you know, pea patch that are about, I don't know, like 15 feet by 10 feet or whatever. Um, and we have two of those located within the food forest, but the whole entire thing is technically part of this community, pea patch community garden program. Um, and there's also the Seattle Indian Health Board plot, which I'll mention later. Um, and besides those two areas, it's pretty much all open harvest, meaning anyone from the public can come through and harvest anything. The food doesn't belong, the plants don't belong to any particular person. Once they're planted there, it's, an, it's a public space. Um, and Jefferson Park is right to, directly to our uh, east, which is a public park. Um, so we pay rent for part of the site in order to charge for classes and pay instructors. Um, our main partner agency, as I mentioned, is the Seattle Department of Neighborhoods, or ESTON, and uh, they provide us with access to water um, through Seattle Public Utilities and um, helps us translate signs and things like that. Um, yeah, we want. We actually have one particular person there that we work that I work pretty closely with, and we have a we maintain that relationship. Um, we have maintained that relationship. Um, and there are, so like I said, there are two areas um, where there's kind of more traditional family plots. And so in total, let me just move this. We have the potential to expand to seven acres, um, but we're about at 3.25 acres, something like that right now. So I don't know how much people know about this. I'm kind of giving a general overview, but um, maybe some of you have heard of this term, maybe you haven't, but what are food deserts and food apartheid? So there are fewer grocery stores in like Northwest and South Seattle as indicated by this map here. Um, and so there's a lack of affordable, fresh, organic produce in those areas. Most of it's kind of concentrated in the city center areas. Um, I don't know what it's like in Thurston County. I'm imagining it's more rural and less urban, um, but I'm sure there's areas where you can reflect and think about um, kind of where the grocery stores are, where the healthy grocery stores are, healthy food um, stores are. So like, for example, even though Whole Foods and PCC provides organic food, um, it may not be affordable for some people while it is for others. So the Beacon Food Forest, where we come in, is that we do have the potential to remedy this issue by turning this huge grassland, right, into, into an urban food forest. And that's exactly what we're doing. But um, one caveat is it must involve the whole community that it feeds, because otherwise, um, you know, without the input of the community, people may not know that it's open harvest and may not know that they can reap the benefits of it. So um, Alice already did a really great introduction, um, but I'll just kind of sum it up. I, um, I grew up about five blocks from the food forest and it means a lot to sort of still be around because it's, it's the, the neighborhood has just changed so much um, racially, um, economically, just a lot of the businesses that I grew up seeing like some, most of them are gone and they've been replaced by different ones. And it's, it's, it, it all happened very quickly. Um, and so um, I'm kind of reflecting on all of that as I do my work at the food forest. Um, and my mom's family, so they were farmers in China. Um, my dad's side were from Hong Kong, but I was born and raised here. So I'm the first generation um, in my family to be born here. Um, and I didn't start actually gardening until 2020. Um, and so, 
you might wonder like, how did I start working at the Beacon Food Forest? Um, the community outreach piece is, is really key for me. And so I'll discuss that in a bit. And this is my cat Mercury, which <laughs> most of you saw just a second ago. Um, so now let's talk about food sovereignty. So food sovereignty is the right of people peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agriculture systems. It puts the aspirations and needs of those who produce, distribute, and consume food at the heart of food systems and policies rather than demands of markets and corporations. So um, this is um, from the Declaration of I don't know how to pronounce that, but I think it's Neilani, the first global forum on food sovereignty in Mali from 2007. Um, and that's really sort of where I've taken the food forest as far as the center of my work. Um, so a shift in mindset has occurred um, in me personally, and as the only staff member at the food forest uh, in an all volunteer run organization that can be really definitive. Um, and so I really appreciate having that, um, having that uh, position. And so I am choosing to use it in a responsible way. So we honor the work of Leah Penniman. Um, many may, maybe some of you know of her, um, but um, she says that permaculture is actually the appropriation of indigenous farming practices from all over. So including Europe, including Africa, Asia. And um, so we stand behind um, Peniman's alternative model, which is ancestral farming or looking to our ancestral farming practices for wisdom. So our family, um, our culture, and so uh, one critique of food forests that uh, it was from an article, um, there was a, a food forest in Austin and, and there was an African-American um, man who lived close to the food forest. And he, he felt that like people actually experiencing the food insecurity, like not having those grocery stores, uh, fresh food accessible to them. Those are the people that aren't typically involved in planning and creating them. Um, and according to a recent census, um, more than 65% of Beacon Hill residents are black indigenous and people of color. Um, I'm one of them, one of the original, at least a um, couple decades ago. Um, yet in 2021, um, our board and our committees averaged 65% white. So the, about the same percentage, but um, not BIPOC. And so, um, I realized, you know, it was simple. We need to decolonize and re-indigenize permaculture. And so that's why I created the BIPOC land share and community garden programs. Um, as somebody who was relatively new, you know, I, as you begin a new job, you're kind of listening and, and soaking in information. And uh, one of the volunteers suggested to me that I conduct um, sort of like roaming listener sessions is what he called it. Um, but basically visiting other urban farming organizations to listen to their needs and how we can partner, you know, as a community outreach coordinator, I have to have my ears open. And um, I specifically sought out the BIPOC organizations because I just knew that I had so much to learn still as, as an Asian American also, I have to recognize my privilege relative to black and brown people as well. Um, in this country. Um, and so um, something that I heard overwhelmingly was um, not necessarily that people need like, you know, one time workshops or like, you know, this fun class once in a while sort of thing. It was like real tangible resources on an ongoing basis, um, something that we do have access to at the Beacon Food Forest. And so um, it's a lot of emotional work for me. Like it was a lot of um, self-processing, like I said, processing my own racism as well as like just um, uh, hearing the, the, the true voices in the community. And so that's why I created the BIPOC land share program. Um, so I facilitated a couple of land shares 
which essentially they're about 25 feet by 50 feet uh, plots. Um, it's shown in this area, it's kind of like a, a drone shot, but um, there's a couple of uh, BIPOC led organizations in the area. One's called the Asian Counseling and Referral Service. There's a queer youth program there that we have partnered with as well as uh, Percussion Farms, which is a black led urban farming organization. And so these organizations actually get to choose what they do with the land. And that's the whole idea of uh, food sovereignty. I'm so sorry, I think, I thought there was somebody coming. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so my goal for 2022 is also to establish a BIPOC community garden in the site you see to the north, so in the blue. And part of, um, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but part of the establishment of this area is um, centering BIPOC voices. I mean, not part of it, that, that is the, the goal. And so um, in order to do that, we had to um, create a BIPOC centered committee and white allies are welcome. However, um, we do have a very strict community agreement, and this is actually taken from Wanawari, um, which is a Black arts um, organization in, in Seattle. And I asked if we could adapt it, and they said yes. Um, but just kind of going over, I don't want to go over too much detail, but essentially, since, you know, since we exist in a BIPOC community, um, you know, uh, BIPOC are foundational to this food forest's existence and, and proliferation. And so uh, allies are welcome, but must respect our intention to be an anti-racist space. Um, and some of the things that we ask white allies to consider um, is to always approach this space and the people in it by being ready to listen, being aware of uh, boundaries, understanding uh, that educating white people is not the focus or intention of the space. So please don't expect BIPOC to explain those intentions to you. Um, understand that sometimes a space may need to be for BIPOC only and allies should respect those times and spaces without question. Um, think before you speak, uh, show your allyship through material support, through donations, and also um, take any discomfort you may feel um, about the space and work it out with other white people. And of course, we don't tolerate any of these other kinds of like um, discrimination. Um, and, and really importantly, allyship is an active process. It's not like you achieve it and then it's like you get this like certificate or something. It's like, it's a continual process. Like for me as well, again, I, I, I admit as an Asian person, um, just historically in the United States, I have had more privilege. And so I have to constantly um, evaluate like my allyship and, and how I'm working on that as well. And so here's kind of a timeline of just those land shares I was talking about. Um, it was not until August of last year that I actually um, kind of uh, had the sort of final proposal together in my mind and, and, and like written out and, and I shared like a PowerPoint to uh, the, the board of directors at our monthly board meeting. And um, there was a lot of, um, I was expecting resistance, but actually there was a lot of um, people that were championing what I was doing. And um, part of, I think just personally and professionally, what I've learned is that um, it's, it's been extremely important and humbling to me to work across different ethnic and racial and cultural barriers. Like, I, you know, it's, it's not that it's like, you know, I can't work with white people because it's, it's a racism issue. It's, it's actually all the more important that I develop relationships with individuals um, to address a systemic problem that we all deal with. Um, and so, um, yeah, so there was definitely a process, you know, I posted about this program on, on local um, uh, Facebook groups um, to see who was interested in coming to do some land sharing with us. And um, I met with people that were interested and gave them tours of the space and, and see what they felt. Um, 
And um, I should mention that um, we actually did a land share before I started working there. Um, David Parasso, um, he is uh, an Italian American. Um, he is very proud of his, his culture and his heritage, which I admire. And he facilitated a land share with Seattle Indian Health Board um, and just gave them a tour like, hey, do you guys want some land um, to, you know, they made a medicinal plant circle and um, it's, it's right in the heart of the Beacon Food Forest. Um, so I think that's kind of symbolic of sort of where we're heading. Um, but yeah, I asked him for a lot of advice, like how do I approach the board about this? You know, how do, how do you do agreements and things like that? So he's been a great ally to me. Um, and so, yeah, in September, we held our first work party uh, uh, with ACRS and that's a picture of them right there on the right. Um, and it's really great to just see people's energy when like after you do something, even if it's as simple as sheet mulching, you know, just laying cardboard down and which, you know, several inches of wood chips on top. It's, it can be really exciting, especially for people. I think just because in Seattle, it's such an urban environment. Many people don't get to go outside as much as they would like. And, and, you know, people are working virtually and they're just kind of like, you know, at their office jobs and it's nice to get out and actually like, do something concrete. And so, um, yeah, in, in the next month, we established our second land share plot for percussion farms. Um, and then earlier this year, um, we held our first, um, I lead that uh, committee, but the BIPOC white ally led community development meeting, where we were actually planning, you know, the different plants we're going to um, grow and um, plant there. And we've gotten a lot of community support uh, from different organizations, national, local, um, just people that want to support us. Um, and it, it feels like it's not just about me. It's about like this whole movement and people that feel a need to reconnect with nature and be, be brought back to the land, but it does take some effort and intentionality. And so in the future, we'll, we'll continue this process, um, through, um, our other programs as well. And yeah, some pictures of from the last year, um, some volunteers um, in the land share area and different people that I've met. Um, it's been really amazing just to sort of be at the center of all this. I get to see all the different connections that are happening. So uh, what are you or could you be doing about all this? Because some of it may be kind of you know, depressing, like, oh, how can we fix racism? How can we fix, like, you know, the sort of corporate chokehold on our, you know, food system and all that stuff? Well, there are some solutions. Um, you can grow a garden and start a food forest wherever you are. Of course, land access is the huge piece. Um, this is actually a picture of my, um, I live on a corner in South Seattle, and I sheet mulched like the entire corner. <laughs> and so uh, if, yeah, if you're ever in Seattle and you see this giant garden, it's probably mine. Um, and my neighbors think I'm crazy because I was bringing cardboard out in the rain and they're like, why do you want to do this? Because, you know, fall and winter is the best time for this because nothing's growing. Um, so yeah, you can do this. Like if you know, maybe even, you know, again, if you know, somebody who has a lawn that they're not using, right? Because um, it's, for me, at, at least I've learned that it's not so much about ownership of land, but um, stewardship. And so, because um, the Beacon Food Forest is actually on public space, so um, it doesn't, it's not owned by us. It is something that we steward with respect. Um, and so you can inspire others, you know, to grow a garden, you know, whether it's social media or just talking to people, you can help your neighbor. Like I mentioned, um, I have definitely done that as well, <laughs> uh, trying to expand the food forests. Um, and then you can also come volunteer if you're interested, if you're ever in Seattle, or if you know somebody in Seattle, please let them know. We have work parties every third Saturday and um, different volunteers will kind of organize different projects they want to get done at the food forest. I've been focused on the BIPOC land share area, obviously, but there's many different things that you can work on and learn through doing, which I think is really cool. And then again, uh, if you want to donate, um, you can go to our givebutter.com 
and make sure that you follow us on Instagram. Um, our handle is simply uh, Beacon Food Forest. And uh, you can also follow us on Facebook. And also, um, let's remember that we need biodiversity of humans too. So we talk a lot about plants and mycelium and insects and pollinators and food forestry and you know different guilds and things like that but but my work specifically as a community outreach person you know they asked me at the interview what does permaculture mean to you right and my response was since there are three pillars of permaculture right there's earth care people care and fair share i feel like the people care aspect has really been missing and so um that has been my focus. Um, so, so if this is this is kind of like a promo for BIPOC, but um, if you want to learn more about food forestry and urban farming, you know, I want BIPOC to actually know about this and and come decide what we want to grow together. Um, I've been trying to put up flyers and get this get the word out about this, but again, it's very new. Um, so it's, it's an exciting time, but it's also kind of like we, we need to get some work done here. Um, so yeah, email me to be added to our BIPOC food committee. Um, and that's where, again, we'll be planning and learning and co-creating the space of food and healing, um, which I'm so excited to see, um, you know, this coming spring and summer is just, I can just imagine how beautiful it will be um, because it's created by many different people from many different cultures and backgrounds. Um, and our community development meetings so far are happening on third Tuesdays um, virtually. And even if you're not a person of color, you can help share information about this with your BIPOC friends and family, even if they're in Thurston County, like they would love to probably come in and, you know, just check out what we're doing on, on our meetings and they're, they're virtual. So um, it doesn't, you don't have to be in Seattle to participate. And also, um, how do we serve the next generation? It's a very critical question. So uh, we need to expose children to more outdoor time and education that's relevant to their future, um, like survival, <laughs> including gardening and self-sufficiency, um, because we've kind of grown up in this, uh, at least I was kind of raised in the society where you kind of can, you can always go to the grocery store, or depend on something or another like external to you, but, but to, to really feel empowered personally, I feel that you have to do everything in your power to take care of yourself. Um, and, and having access to land is really the key, especially in an urban setting that is very, very hard to come by um, often. And so we need to encourage young people of color, specifically who have been historically disenfranchised and disengaged from the land um, to be closer to it and learn where their food comes from. And we need to break cycles of consumerism by learning how to save seeds um, and eat real food. Thank you for attending. Uh, any questions? I have a few in that come through our food and agriculture group, but before I ask Terry those, I'd love to, yeah, open it up for everyone here. Feel free to shout them out or put it in the chat. Looks like there's still some people joining. I see some, <laughs> some late arrivals. Okay. Okay, well. If there's none, and please still continue to um, drop them in the chat if you have any. Um, so Cherry, I'm curious, on your first slide in your timeline, you shared with us um, from like 2009 when the idea was sort of first conceived and um, mm -hmm. the first proposals were made to 2012 when the first plants went in. Um, I'd love to hear about that process of working with the city, um, and I know our food and agriculture group at, at Thurston Climate Action Team is really interested in how we can get more food growing on public lands here. So, so we are really interested in hearing about just that interfacing with the city and that relationship and, and how, um, how you all accessed that public land that was sitting there covered in grass. I mean, yeah, it's like a huge, um, 
you know, it's a huge honor to really steward that much land. That's, that's seven acres in an urban area. Um, you know, growing up there, I would, you know, take the school bus to and from, and I thought that people were just like, oh, is this like a giant pea patch? Like, I didn't know what was going on. And um, I never, I, I always wondered, like, why don't people use that space? But I never imagined it would become a food forest. Um, so it definitely took a lot of, I think, well, again, I wasn't the one who who started it, so I may not be the best person to ask. But um, from my knowledge, it was a lot of design work um, from these four people on Beacon Hill. Again, they took a permaculture design course, um, and um, there was a lot of, I think, relevant principles that helped them create a landscape that was um, sustainable and that was going to be um, well received uh, by the city. But um, there was, I think the most important thing that from my perspective is the relationship building because we still have a very close relationship with this particular, I uh, won't name their name, but it's a person who works at the Seattle Par Department of Neighborhoods. Um, they're a community garden coordinator and I I've worked very closely with this person and they, um, they're very much a champion of this. Um, they actually don't personally feel like the word permaculture is, is necessary to, to continue or, or um, make sure this project thrives, but they're just really, really in tune with the idea of like bringing nature into the city. And so, so having that champion in the city uh, government um, is extremely important to continue and, and ensuring that we also do things um, according to what their expectations are. So like, um, for example, like we're supposed to sort of sheet mulch uh, to like a very clean edge so that the people that mow the, the remaining grass uh, are not upset at us because they're like, oh, well, you know, it's easy to mow. It's, it's, I mean, eventually it'll be like hopefully no grass. And so that saves them some money and, and some resources and, and, you know, whatever. So um, yeah, definitely relationship building, but also you can see that map on the, on the right side. That's actually from one of the founders of the food forest, um, Jackie, that's her, um, her sketch there. And you'll notice the little bubbles, those are, those are guilds. So, um, you know, like there's um, seven different layers of a food forest, but the, the fruit trees, so like an apple tree, for example, there can be like an herbaceous layer and a ground cover layer and vines and, and so on and so forth. And so there was definitely a lot of work and effort put into, ensuring that the design was, um, you know, like accurate to what we were actually going to do. And um, like the city, you know, they, they don't necessarily like taking risks. And so we had to prove to them that this was a risk worth taking. And I think probably the most important thing for them is that it was a sustainable project, not necessarily like environmentally sustainable, but like people sustainable and that people would continue to volunteer and so my position is actually funded um, by a grant and um, I am also looking at applying to different grants and things to, to continue this project because it, it is about reaching out to the community and making sure that people feel invested in this. You know, people are going to want to volunteer here. People are going to want to donate to us to, to ensure the, you know, the fiscal um, soundness of our organization to, to continue to um, like partner with different places that are kind of doing similar work already. So we're just working together. And I, I, I think for me, at least just this, my idea about the food forest is that it's really like a place where it's like an experimental educational learning ground. So we're kind of like an umbrella for um, almost like a safety net, like for a lot of different things that people want to test out in terms of urban farming and food forestry that you couldn't really do in most places. You can't just go to a random, you know, grass field. And I mean, there's a lot of places like that where I live in, you know, South Seattle, there's like the power lines that go over the grass. And I'm always like, oh, why don't they just turn that into food forest? But you can't just go out there and start, you know, digging stuff up. So, but this is a place where people can safely, um, experiment with with different um, gardening techniques and also like um, with with um, building different community connections which to me is 
I think the most important thing is that everyone come and get involved and get connected to the land. So sorry, that was a really long answer. It was awesome. Thank you. Um, we have a bunch of questions popping up in the chat. Uh, the first oh, one that's great. <laughs> is, um, Melinda is asking, how long does it take to complete a section of sheet mulching? That is a great question. Um, so let me show you that picture again. Um, so you see where the people are standing. So I don't have a great picture right now of it, but anyways, the, the people that are standing there on the left, um, in the left photo, that's like our BIPOC, part of our BIPOC land share area. And I think I led maybe like, I don't know, five or six different sheet mulching work parties over the course of the past, you know, six months or so. And um, yeah, it's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of work to coordinate people and also to get um, get all the wood chips delivered. And, and we, we actually pick up our uh, cardboard from this like cardboard manufacturer in Seattle. And they just, you know, like when they make cardboard boxes and there's pieces of it that are kind of odds and ends. And so they give that to us, but we have to get, you know, one of our volunteers has a pickup truck. So I actually went with them last time. It's a lot of work just to, you know, get all the supplies and and the people and you know people to come and and also uh, we get wood chips from the city of Seattle they have arborists so they chop down trees and, and they shred them and then they we 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 have a connection there again the connection is key um he comes and drops it off so I don't know like it probably takes um we've done a little little sections at a time I would say like the acre or so that is the BIPOC uh land share area probably took like well, each session was like maybe three or four hours. So three times six, 18 hours or something for an acre. I don't know. It depends on how many people you have. If you have a huge group of people, it gets done really quick. Yeah, that's a great question. Lisa, do you want to ask your question or should I read it? Sure. Hi, Alice. Hi, Cherry. Thank you so much for doing this amazing work and this, this really good presentation. I'm wondering yeah, if you um, if you compost on the food forest land or if you use the city of Seattle compost. Um, I was looking for your picture while you were talking. <laughs> um, uh, you could you say that again? The compost. Yeah, I was wondering if you if you all compost on the food forest property or. Or and or if you use the city of Seattle um, compost. Yeah, that's a great question as well. Um, we actually have a compost team. Uh, Rena uh, leads that, and she's been involved with the food forest since I think close to the beginning. And we call her we call her the compost queen. But um, she leads pretty much every work party I've seen her. Um, we have this kind of compost, uh, we have a, a compost bin that somebody built and um, she chops up like different um, things from the food forest that have been pruned or, or you know, branches or things like that. And, and um, she uses, there's like little machetes, it sounds kind of scary, but it's like, they use those to chop up the, the, um, the, the, the debris, I guess. Um, and um, a lot of people um, come and volunteer uh, for those work parties and then um we kind of continue she she's kind of the person that knows the most about it but anyone can kind of come and, and help with that um and so we definitely do compost what we have and that's kind of part of that like closed loop system and um also more recently some people started doing hugel culture which um if you're not familiar um it's it's like a, it's a German term, but it's, it's, it was um, just basically the idea is like you're burying um, uh, logs or twigs or, you know, branches and things like that, or like, you know, the stuff we chop up to compost. Um, and, you, and then you put like uh, cardboard and wood chips on top of that. So you kind of make a mound and it's like a long-term breakdown process or a long-term composting uh, process. And um, so as like it gets rained on, which is a lot of rain in Seattle. So as it gets kind of soaked with water, the logs and all those like bigger woody things that would take longer to compost in a compost pile, those soak up the moisture like uh, a sponge. And then it kind of, as it rots, it turns into that sponge and it, it, it holds onto moisture when it's dry and then releases it. 
um, uh, when, when it's needed. And so that's something people have been working on. Um, but compost is, um, yeah, it's something that we try not to buy as much, but we do have some annual veggie areas like the Helix Giving Garden um, that we have sourced local compost for. Um, and I recently met like a, U this is kind of long, but I'll just be brief. So I met with a UW soil scientist who does soil testing. And she told me about some really good sources of organic compost. Cause oftentimes, I don't know if it's a problem in Thurston County, but in, in Seattle are, you know, people like, you know, you can't trust people hundred percent to be responsible with what they throw in their yard waste. We would like to think that people don't throw trash in there, but oftentimes urban comp urban generated compost could have like plastics and all these nasties in them. And so we've been trying to source better compost for, especially for the BIPOC land share program. So thanks for that question. Thank you. All right, your question is next. Do you wanna ask it? Sure, um, hi everybody. Um, my name is, can you hear me? Okay, cool. Uh, these headphones, yep. I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, my name is Barrett and I live in Tacoma actually, um, but my question is just about community engagement and what your best tools are um, that you would recommend just for getting people interested and, you know, wanting to keep coming back and just tips for gathering support. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, that's kind of the question I'm, I'm always asking myself. <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, I think honestly, um, really experiencing that connection on site is kind of the big sell, if you will, like to people. And so just getting people there and especially with the BIPOC land share where it's not just like, you know, sheet mulching and, you know, being around nature, which is awesome, but also the, the purpose of that, where, you know, I'm, I usually, you know, like this group in this photo I was gathering them and, and, and sharing with them that, what I share would shared with you guys that I grew up, you know, five blocks away. And this is, this is very much home for me and, and very personal for me and, and things like that, where it's, it's, it's a story where you're engaging people and why you're doing this work and why you think they should join you. Um, because then that pulls them closer to your work. And, and, and often, you know, you might even get volunteers that, that help you do some of that work or they can go and recruit other volunteers. Um, so it really is a community effort. I, I, again, I'm the only staff member, but I cannot do this stuff alone. And so, um, uh, I think as far as like recruitment though, um, you know, social media, um, is a really nice, you know, tool. I think that if it's used, um, well, you know, people really respond to, again, it doesn't have to be superficial messaging, like, oh, just look at these pretty flowers. Like, it's actually like, oh, like, this is what the Beacon Food Forest is like leading the nation and doing in terms of food forests, right? We're, we're diversifying um, in every aspect. And so that's, that's something where I think, yeah, like I'm also in charge of the social media. And so it's, 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 a, it's a real honor to be able to have that platform. And so I'm just making sure that I use it in a responsible way. Thank you. Um, and we also have another question in the chat. Are any pieces of the food forest monetized? And they wrote, i.e. pea patch versus giving garden. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, and I, I recognize that, you know, this is a, this is kind of like, you know, we're in a totally different county and maybe many of you don't know much about us. And so it's, it's important to sort of define um, how we operate. So we, we are a 501c3, so we're not allowed to, um, we're a nonprofit organization. So we're not allowed to like sell any of the vegetables or fruits or anything like that to make profit. Um, and so uh, anything that we really get money from is supposed to be used again. Uh, you know, it's supposed to be recycled, just like, you know, the compost and stuff. Um, but like we, we can charge for classes and things like that um, to pay for the instructors for those classes, which are often volunteers. Um, and we have an education committee for that. But as far as like, yeah, monetization, we're not really, we have to be very careful about that actually to protect our uh, nonprofit status. And so, and the land that we operate on is public. And so that's another consideration. We can't really like hold, you know, private events there. And, you know, we've had like 
you know, really famous chefs and stuff contact us and like, can we do like a farm to table event there? And, you know, it'll be all, you know, fancy and stuff. And we can't really, we can't really say, you know, what, to accept those offers, but we, we do have a gathering plaza where we, we do share food at different events and anyone is welcome to use it. Um, like there's, you know, people that come through and they, there was like a story time, group which was really cute and and we've had tiny trees preschool but their kids come and they have a little plot so there's ways to um, create value without the money aspect yeah great question does anyone else have any questions for cherry yeah phyllis yeah, I, I put a comment in the chat um, about here in Thurston County, uh, there's a real problem with finding compost and mulches and things like that that don't include biosolids. Um, and the, the person that uh, is part of our group that kind of researched this, I think he ended up saying he had to go to Seattle to, to find some. So, but uh, I don't know if you've had that issue of, uh, uh, you know, biosolids uh, are, you know, allowed to be sold as part of fertilizers, especially commercial ones. But, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of concern about uh, toxics and some of the things that are in biosolids uh, and food grown in soils that were spread with biosolids. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that um, perspective from Thurston County, because like, you know, maybe as much as you guys don't know about the food forest in Seattle, I don't know much about Thurston County. So I appreciate the the little like, uh, you know, the little glimpse. And um, yeah, so I think as far as like compost goes, like there is abundant sources of that here in Seattle. But again, like the quality of it has been to me kind of questionable as well for a different reason for because of trash and, you know, contamination in that way. But I, I recognize that biosolids could also because of just pesticide use and antibiotic use and things like that in animals, um, and also, um, you know, humans and stuff. And so I think, I think it's important to seek out, um, so like me personally meeting with that UW soil scientist was really eye-opening because I don't have the skill set to do all that research and, and analyze, you know, soil samples, but she does. And so partnering with people that do have those resources, maybe a local um, university or like extension service already has some data on this, or maybe you can get them to create some data on this. Um, and it would be really great for your community to know, like, what's the best quality um, compost because, you know, it's, it's still a thing that we're working on here in Seattle. Like just, um, you know, we have uh, the Tilth Alliance does um, different compost giveaways and things like that. And we just, you know, we appreciate that, but we also want to make sure that people that can't necessarily afford compost are getting the best quality, not just, you know, perpetuating that system of inequality or inequity. Thanks, Cherry. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, any other questions for Cherry? I have another one, but I want to ask you all. Yeah, I saw a hand up. Guys. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you had uh, data on um, how much it costs in terms of labor, time, and money, as well as land to uh, do what you've done with the food forest, as well as what the output has been. And if so, could I have access to your statistics? Uh, that is a great question. And I think for the most part, it is above me. Um, I could prop, I could potentially connect you with some of the folks that started the food forest and have, and, and the treasurer and people like that. But it's, it's interesting how the food forest kind of developed because it's, it's very much a grassroots organization. And sometimes, you know, the, the story of how things were built kind of stays with those people. But I will tell you that it's a lot of money. Um, we have um, money that came to us from the Seattle Department of Neighborhoods um, in a large amount. Uh, we have closed out of different um, financial relationships um, with them and, and restarted new ones. So like I'm applying for um, a couple of different grants um, uh, through the city and different local organizations, but it takes a lot. And also, um, again, like private donors are a really important source of ongoing support. So 
um, one of our volunteers um, got us uh, a Give Butter account, which is a way that we can track donations. And um, yeah, and so it, it, I see the donations that come in and just like individuals that have reoccurring donations are a really important thing. As far as the actual like data and statistics and the, the um, uh, sort of the financial breakdown, we do have an annual report that I just posted on our, um, it's a public, publicly viewable report um, because we are accountable to the public and to our donors. And so you can go on our website, it's under, um, like about the about tab and then you go to annual report. So you can check that out on your own. Uh, we have them for the last couple of years um, on there. And so, um, yeah, you can you can look on the on the very bottom of that document or the end of that document, there's a lot of financial. So honestly, I'm not an expert on that. So I just go to the board meetings and they tell me how much money we have and stuff. So you can check it out. Thank you. Um, if I could ask another question. Um, I know that the local tribe has a community garden. I don't know if it's open to non-tribal members though. And I was wondering if anyone else knew uh, what, if, if they have classes for non-members or, or if anyone is in contact with, with whoever is in charge of that project. I'll see if anyone else in the room knows. As far as I know, the, um, the Squaxin Island um, Community Garden is just for Squaxin folks. But I could be wrong. If anyone knows to the contrary, please chime in. Okay. Um, so, Cherry, I have one more question for you. Um, I'm curious the agreement that you have with the city, I mean, it's not, it's not exactly like a lease, but I'm wondering, does it renew in the same way that, that a lease would? Like, do you have to kind of renegotiate that agreement with the city on a, on a regular basis? Um, as far as I know, not really in terms of the basic foundation of it, just because as a nonprofit, we have sort of taken over um, management of that land, at least, uh, well, the stewardship of it. Um, but, um, you know, the city could, you know, take it away from us at any point if we're doing something irresponsible. Um, and so that's why the partnership, again, with the city and showing respect and, uh, you know, dedication to the work that we do in relationship with them is important. And uh, again, like the, the different designs for the different phases that are built out are um, incremental. So it's not just like all at once we have this, you know, big plan that we're gonna implement. It's in stages. And uh, again, we're kind of at the, the very top of the, the, or at the very edge of the phase two expansion. And so I imagine a phase three and a phase four um, will come into to, to play um, not too far in the future. Um, but again, it, yeah, it definitely takes um, a lot of trust building with uh, local officials and, it, and you're lucky if you can find someone who, who is a champion for you. Thank you. Any other questions before we wrap it up? Oh yeah, go for it. I have a question. Um, it's Cherry, right? Uh, yes. Thank you so much, first of all, for coming to and telling us about everything that you're doing. This is amazing and uh, really inspirational. Um, and also I'm wondering, um, are, I'm kind of really curious about what the beginning phases are like in this process as far as like how it was to go and get a partner in the city like what was that like or um, you know how do you get your foot in the door kind of so um, do you happen to know like are the founders still around to be contacted to kind of tell that story at all yeah I can I can imagine why you guys would be curious about that because you know if you want to start um, a food forest. Yeah. Um, Glenn, uh, Herlihy, I think his last name is mispronounced, but he is still pretty active. He, he lives in Beacon Hill and I can put you guys in touch with him. I don't know what his availability is to talk to like every single person, but like as an organization or whatever, you guys can contact him. And, um, 
Yeah, he actually helped me pick up some cardboard the other day. So he's definitely available <laughs> in some way. Um, and he's a really great person. He understands the importance of the BIPOC involvement. He uh, is, and it's very critical again, to have allyships um, across different, you know, every person has so many aspects of ourselves, right? It's not just our race. It, like we have so many different, we're like diamonds with different facets, right? We're, we're so multifaceted in a good way. And so I think, yeah, so it, it's really important that I have that, we have that connection with him still. Um, as far as the other founders, I think Jackie has actually moved to a different state. Um, and the other two, I can't quite remember, but Glenn is probably the one that is the most involved as far as like how things were. I know there was a lot of pushback. I know that, um, you know, it was, there was many like like they came, you know, they, they went to the city and then they had to come back and draw up a plan and then they had to come back and get community approval. And there was many different back and forths. It wasn't just like a once and done sort of thing, especially for this much space, you know. Um, and I wasn't, again, I wasn't there. So I'm not the, maybe the best person to ask, but um, I'm really excited that you guys want to take this on. Um, you know, we need this like everywhere, you know, everywhere possible right now, um, especially as, you know, like, you know, COVID and everything is, is showing us that our, our food systems aren't as secure as we think they are. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, the, oh yeah, Lisa, go ahead. I just, I thought of a very practical um, question. How do you keep the deer from eating everything? <laughs> And the bunnies. We don't have deer. <laughs> That's I'm how urban when we are. Yeah, I know. Like I was just gonna say, we're lucky because we don't have. I see a lot of because I'm a I'm a big gardener too. So I, I go on like the Facebook gardening groups and I see a lot of people talking about deer and 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 we do have bunnies. I I definitely they're they're cute enough that they're not <laughs> a huge but but yeah the food forest there's definitely bunnies and things but we 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 imagine the space as a place for um all all organisms um and and in that way they're not really um uh pests in, in the traditional sort of gardening um mantra or whatever um but uh some people, I guess, have noticed that there is more birds of prey also coming. And so they kind of like balance out the system. Um, right. You know, we don't we don't ask them to volunteer or anything, but they just come when they do. And it is it is a little tricky. So we're not allowed to have any, um, you know, livestock or animals which um, many other um, food forests may be able to if they're, you know, maybe more rural, but it's, it's a, a requirement for us not to have that in an urban environment, you know, understandably. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, as far as different pests and things are, are involved, um, or as, as those, um, you know, those aren't really something that we can, we can um, get rid of per se, that, but we, we welcome them to, you know, work things out amongst each other. <laughs> Good, good, good. They're, they're more like competitors, sort of, although, right. Yeah. We, yeah, I would like to welcome them in too, but, and not a but. Yeah, it's kind of about creating so much abundance that it doesn't even matter. Like there's even been issues, even with, in terms of human beings, you know, like there's been, um, occasionally there's like houseless people um, that come through or people that come in like you know, um, maybe they take a whole bunch of food at once or something like that. But, you know, we are an open harvest food forest. We're not here to like, you know, say certain people can take something and certain people can't, you know, especially if people are needing, needing food, um, you know, and so that's kind of a, a thing where um, we're, we're just creating so much abundance. And that's part of the goal of, you um, um, including everyone in the community is that we also grow like culturally relevant foods. And so all of that is kind of uh, part of the, the, the goal of the food forest is to create so much food that, you know, doesn't matter. Like we wouldn't notice if a bunny came and chomped on some carrots or something. Lovely. Thank you, Cherry. Yeah, of course. Lisa. Nice to see your face. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sherry, for joining us and just sharing your knowledge and experiences with us. And it's, it's so inspirational. And um, yeah, like you say, this is what needs to be happening everywhere. So thank you for championing, championing it. <laughs> um, had a hard time yeah. with that one. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. I love seeing all the smiles and everybody is really like enthusiastic and, and uh, supportive of what I'm doing um, or, you know, just um, engaged in, in this process. And I'm happy to share, uh, you know, I have some brochures about uh, the BIPOC land share that I'm happy to share with you guys to share with other people. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to put together some resources as well. Great. If folks want to reach you, um, is that you have like a basic info at Beacon Hill Food Forest email? What, what's the best way for them to reach out? Yeah, you guys can just email me. It's um, I have a direct email, a cherry, uh, like the fruit cherry, <laughs> at uh, food forest. So that's uh, all one word, foodforest.ngo. Um, and so that's my email. And uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions, just send, send them to me. And if you're part of our food and agriculture group, I will send out you know, any of the brochures that Cherry shares with me, I'll send out to our listserv too. So if you're part of that group, look for them there as well. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming out and, and listening and learning together. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Good night, everybody.